All right, coming up next week when our guest from Noah shows up. Yeah. I think we, I, you know, you, you we will not speak ill of Noah in this in this space. <laughs> I'm all for I would love to get a guest from Noah. That would oh. that would be that would be our dream guest. So legit, this is one of the things that I actually was uh, upset about in terms of the, the demise of Twitter. Weather Twitter is amazing, and it has not yet been replaced with, with Weather Mastodon or Weather Blue Sky. And it's like one of these communities that's just crazy, crazy good. You'd think with Blue Sky, it would be like right there in the name. Yeah, it's right there. It's on the tin. All right. Well, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> you are not joining a Oxide and Friends on weather, although that sounds like that's going to be a future episode. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but what we, we do have Ashley Williams here. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Ashley, a little bit of a of a repeat guest star here um, because you were on only, I think, a couple weeks ago, right? I mean, it feels like it was a, another a, a, a year ago, but it was only a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this. Uh, this Rust trademark issue, and the, it, that was, um, and we in that discussion, we talked a lot about trademarks and what it meant for an open source project, and we kept grazing on open source governance. Uh, Adam, did you did you go back and re-listen to that? By the way, yeah, I did actually this weekend. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, pretty interesting to re-listen to it, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, very prescient. Very prescient. Yeah, because I think, Ashley, you in particular were hitting on some governance issues, and uh, and uh, Adam Jacob was there and s- describing how much he would love to just like have the like, like weather Twitter, like let's nerd out on open source governance. And we, we kind of grazed these issues, but you made a bunch of really good points about why the, the, the trademark issue we were discussing was actually reflecting some deeper governance issues. And just for for context for broader folks, the reason we are here now is we there there was another uh, blow up for really lack of a better euphemism um, where the, uh, the over the weekend um, a uh, Rustconf made a pretty serious mistake and they 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 demoted a keynote from a speaker due to reasons and uh that speaker rightfully pulled out of the conference and uh then wrote actually a great blog post explaining here is why i am not going to be presenting at rustconf that caused a bunch uh, th- then other folks folks in the core team they began to describe here are some of the problems we see with rust governance well i'm gonna and, jump in just real quickly yeah. Brian, because yeah, yeah. the core team doesn't exist anymore so we should probably call it what they call it which is going to oh, be God. its own topic probably which is, is leadership chat. Which, if it sounds like a group text, like that, it is. It does sound <laughs> like a group text. I feel like if you every time you see leadership chat, you substitute group text. I feel that like that's kind of how I hear it. So yeah, I agree. So the, the, the but a member of the 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 leadership of Rust uh, stepped away and wrote a blog entry explaining why. Um, and I, th- there was a lot of uh, and then a lot of bad takes on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just absolutely loaded with bad takes. So we actually don't want to dissect all of that, in part because the Roscom folks have acknowledged that this was wrong. This was a mistake, and they they erred when they they pulled this keynote. What it was a mistake to pull it, and they re- they sorely regret the mistake, at least according to them. Um, and I think we don't want to talk about the the. the necessarily the mechanics of that, although that that probably merits some discussion. I think what we want to get into is how did did a community get here? How did a leadership team get here? How did an open source project get here? And in particular, I want to talk about the issues that are not just unique to Rust, because actually, I'm sure one of the things that, that you were very frustrated by is uh, everyone using this as an opportunity to be sanctimonious about their own language or community or system where it's like, well, we would we never have these problems over here in this community. It's like, well, come on. Um, there is a lot here that is is endemic. And that's kind of what I want to hit on. Because actually, when you were on here, again, a couple weeks ago, I think you had a bunch of really good openers. And just by, by way of, of introducing you, someone who's been in, in a bunch of different communities, but in particular, you and I both share history in the Node community and in the Rust community, which I think gives yeah. us 
a lot of perspective. You were, you were instrumental um, in setting up the Rust Foundation. So you, you, you've uh, been around the block on this one for sure. Um, so first of all, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for coming with it, coming on yeah, Oxen Friends to talk about this. Thanks for having me. I wish I had reviewed the things that I said in the trademark conversation like y'all did ahead of this um, that I, I haven't. So I'll have to, I'll have to re- leave it to you to remind me the things that I said. But yeah, um, I don't know. It's, it's been, so I left Rust Governance mid last year. Um, I don't know. It's been interesting to reflect on how governance in Rust changed over my tenure there. Uh, and then how it's changed since, and then like comparing that to like my experiences in governance in Node and even kind of like tangentially in the Ruby communities. Um, but yeah, I guess the first thing I would definitely say is like, I only think the only thing that I really think is categorically different between a lot of those things is like the passage of time. Um, but mm. yeah, I, I, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see. Um, And I do think how folks are reacting to these types of things have a lot to do with like the different expectations that folks have these days of open source and open source governance, which is funny because if you like look five years ago, some of these like requirements like were unheard of and in many ways like unspeakable. (laughs) Elaborate on that. What kind of requirements? How have that? How has it changed in the last five years? Well, I mean, I think it's probably worth noting that, like, the suggestion of having a code of conduct was, like, inflammatory. <laughs> um, and, I mean, it, regardless of how you feel about codes of conduct, I have my own complicated opinions about them. Um, but, like, I think the requirements for transparency, the requirements for plurality, like... Um, the fact that the one-to-many communication style has kind of like been amplified and then what is tolerable on Twitter versus not has also changed. Um, In what direction has it changed, by the way? I'm not sure. So as somebody who was like a little baby open source governance person in like 2017, like right when tech was like, oh, maybe these gamer gators have a good idea of what's going on. Um, and like cancel culture was like in full swing, honestly, on both sides. And like, I think a lot of things have shifted from that, like the way things often shift, like as a reaction to an extreme. Um, but I mean, I think. I think we've put a lot of requirements on governance when a lot of the original open source governance was happy to be this one brilliant genius guy in his garage and we just listened to him. <laughs> yeah, and now, it, it, now we have like multi like million dollar organizations with massive companies sponsoring individuals who sit in a room and have eight different levels of documentation. <laughs> um, like, it's it's a pretty radical change. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Because it, So what you're referring to, of course, is the BDFL model, the Benevolent Dictator for Life model, which even that term is sounding like increasingly dated. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I, and, uh, right, it's not the, that long ago. <laughs> it's not that long ago. And we, ha- I, and I think that part of the reason that sounds dated is because I think that for a long time, people were looking to I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that Linux popularized the idea of the BDFL. Um, it'd be interesting to know if it was even coined in Linux, but certainly it was the canonical BDFL. Um, you, you've got this uh, eponymous uh, system that uh, clearly the, the Torvalds is the, the dictator for life uh, of Linux. But I, I, I don't know, Adam, I, maybe this is, we're misreading history here, but it feels like when the, when he, there was some hot water, well-deserved hot water about how people were being treated in Linux. And people were saying like, look, I'm no longer contributing to Linux because I don't want to deal with these kind of flame wars on the mailing list. And people begin to realize like, maybe this model like is not, it's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 I mean, the FL is sort of tongue in cheek for life, but there is a, a real generational problem built into it um, where, you know, so it's not going to, 
you know these these projects. I, I think I'd heard BDFL even around like Larry Wall in Perl and Van Rossum on Python. So even before I, I heard that associated with with Linux, but maybe I got the time timing wrong. Um, but you know that like how do you how how do you keep someone's attention literally for their entire life without them wanting to move on to the next thing? Um, this whole idea of how, you know how you pass the torch is pretty tricky. It is rich. That's a very good point about it being that it, you do have this kind of generational problem built into the for life business. In that, like, how do you, how do you assure that a a system is going to shift as it needs to with time and shifting mores when you've actually already kind of enshrined? Because you're right. You know, it kind of reminds me. You're of, basically of, only say you just say succession. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, okay. We, 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 after we slow walking you there, right? Okay. We we, we we finally got it out there. So uh, this past weekend was the the season finale and series finale to Succession. Adam, we all know that you, um, you you like to watch your television twenty years after it comes out. So we know that this is we this is really just speaking to Adam Leventhal, circa twenty forty three. But for, for for the rest of us, we actually watched the Succession finale um, over the weekend. Uh, terrific finale, and I do feel that uh, th- actually, I mean, Succession does feel like it's not unrelated because it, it, Succession is, it, and I think when we talk about like open source governance, we are, it is at some level about power or perception of power, and you know why, what makes people crave it, what makes people fight for it, what, and I think it's power in contrast to to leadership. Um, which I think is is when you have a uh, a, a BDFL project, um, you know you have uh, on the one hand you've solved some problems, I guess, in that like well governance I guess is solved, but you've also created now the project is actually a person um, almost by definition, and it, it's going to actually follow the whims of that person, um, which is a great point right? because because d- dictators are not famed leaders right? they're, they're famed strongmen or, or they're straight famed for the power so you know built into it is not this notion of rallying the community but rather uh you know, leading by fiat not not by you know by true leadership it, 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 adam that's totally true and i think it, it kind of reminds me of google's like oh our model is like don't be evil where it was meant as like oh this is meant to be like ironic and then it all of a sudden became like the bar like no 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 we're not going to be evil <laughs> You know, sorry. Well, no, we're going to be bad, but not evil. We're going to be shady. Right up to that line. Yeah. Right, you're right up to that line. And you're like, you know, I think you meant that as a joke. And I feel like BDFL, too, is like BDFL, like it's meant to be tongue in cheek, I think. Right. Isn't it kind of like winking at the idea of like, no, of course, like dictators for life, that's obviously bad, but this is a benevolent dictator for life. So it's, it, and, but we, we kind of drive past the fact that, like, wait a minute. Dictator, it's like, this is bad. This is fundamentally not a great structure. So So, I think maybe to like kind of pop the stack a little bit, I think one of the things that's interesting about the topic that we want to talk about today is, I think the original way you phrased it is like, who, who governs open source? And I feel like already between like you and Adam, there's been some like really interesting questions here, but I, I don't think there's consensus on one if open source needs governance and then two if open source needs governance what that governance is and i think a lot of that has to do with kind of what i see as like the life cycle of open source projects because i think what governance is and needs to be like changes really dramatically over the life cycle of a project and I don't know, humans are bad at transition. <laughs> um, but like succession between those different stages of governance, I think can be really, really complicated. And I think that's certainly something that's identifiable in this situation with Rust, which is like Rust has existed for a very, very long time and it has changed really dramatically over the course of that time. We are in a, a new phase and everybody involved is reacting to that. Um, in positive and negative ways. <laughs> Actually, give me, elaborate on that. What what are some of those stages, and and kind of where maybe we can talk about maybe some certain pro- projects that are at at different stages in the kind of their life cycle. 
Yeah, so, I mean, since we were talking about BDFLs, it's probably worth mentioning, I'm sure it's been mentioned on the show before, that, like, in theory, you could describe Russ as having started kind of vaguely in a BDFL model because it was somebody's kind of side research project um, that became their work uh, at Mozilla. Uh, and then as things grew and changed, like, different groups of people uh, were put together uh, to try and help organize it. And that had to do with, like, the growth of the popularity, the growth of the usage of the project. But, like, most open source projects don't start with the idea that, you know, eventually the U.S. government is going to endorse people using it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, well, and also this is one of those where if you were to get in a time machine and you were to tell Graydon, like, this is what happens to Rust, you run the risk of, like, really changing the future, right? Because I just you would change people's behavior in a way that would ultimately make it potentially not successful. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and I, I think you see this in companies and like, I don't know, th there's a lot of reasons why metaphors about like companies and products to open source, like people don't like it. I think the economics are actually like kind of similar, um, which have a lot to do with this, but like, yeah, a failure to adapt, like when you go from like the zero to one, the one to 10, the 10 to hundred, uh, kills most things. <laughs> And well, and I think also this idea that like it, not every open source project is going to do is going to going to go on that trajectory or should right I mean it's like the, an open source project can stay small and I mean speaking for many many of the ones that we are involved in Adam that's right where I mean it's stuff that's like that I mean and some stuff like no one else is using fine that's easy some stuff like a small number of people are using and it kind of stays easy and then it's it's I mean. Are we going to ever have, you know, a drop shot foundation, Adam? I mean, that feels, I, I don't know, feels, feels unlikely. It feels unlikely, the drop shot being the, the web framework that Dave Pacheco and I um, built early days at Oxide. And, and that, this gets to Ashley's question, you know, do, we, do we need governance? And certainly for lots and lots and lots of projects, even successful projects, like you don't really need governance. So I think it's an interesting question, when, at what point, does that does that necessity become the mother of invention, right? At what point does that governance, uh, you know, become something that is is worse than its absence? Yeah. What is the Rubicon that a project yeah. crosses where it's like, okay, we actually need, and I mean, this obviously happens in companies too, where it's like we, and and you know, we talk about Dunbar's number a lot as kind of being a size where you really need to kind of start thinking about the things differently. But actually, do you have a rubric for where we start thinking about uh, and, and as Colin says in the track, small open source projects can also have huge drama. That is absolutely true. <laughs> There's definitely, you can have, I feel like the number of people required to have an open source dust up might not even be two. You might even be able to do it with a, a single person may be able to actually, a one person project. Um, may totally. I mean, I, I've looked at lots of issues I filed on my own projects and thought, what is this knucklehead thinking from six months ago? Did you did you ban Pass Adam from your project? And actually, Pass Adam resigned. <laughs> yeah. Pass Adam wrote a blog entry resigning. So forget it. Forget that guy. Yeah, um, yourself, right. but, so, but it just does not take very many people. Yeah, so actually, wait, is, do you have a rubric? This is. Uh, I mean, one. No, I don't have a rubric. But are you like calling out the former middle school science teacher um, for <laughs> so many rubrics? Um, I mean, like, I think of governance as abstraction, like fundamentally and i do love being like really reductionist and like calling everything an abstraction so that's like a character flaw um but like you should build it when you're able to like feel and identify the pain of its absence is kind of how i think about it um and so i don't know someone said this to me when i was helping set up the rust foundation but it was like it's always better to have a foundation too late than too early yes. and yeah. uh I think I agree with that. I, Adam has posted something in the chat, and I'm like very interested in him like expanding on it because it sounds like it might be in disagreement with what I'm saying, but I'm not entirely sure what it means. Um, but, yeah, but I only uh, have eight minutes, and then I gotta what go. Was it? I only have eight minutes. Oh my gosh! Eight well, then minutes. hurry up. I'll stop. Yeah, go. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> right, so I think I think the hardest thing about adding governance in open source projects is the lack of explicit power in general. And so 
there is this explicit there's an implicit thing that's like okay whoever started the project gets to do what they want and that can be fine like right if there's two of us fine <laughs> right like i started i get i get what i i get my way you know um but i think the sooner you can make that explicit the better off you are because now you can use that explicitness to bootstrap your way into healthier forms of governance right so as you grow there's there are rules there is a structure there there is a mechanism it might be the most trivial of mechanisms right it might just be whatever ashley says goes goes work done you know and at some point it needs to evolve to like a more structured kind of governance but i think we've seen this failure in a lot of different modes where you can get to a really freaking big community with very little or no explicit power at all um and what happens when that happens is we get little syndicates forming that like know how to manipulate that structure and then and then 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 they fight yeah it's the, this is really oh interesting Adam. And, it, <laughs> and you're packing into what i think it's kind of ashley's rubric of when you can fee- identify the pain of its absence and yeah. adam what you're talking about when you've got you know th- this kind of whispering happening and you've got kind of lieutenants that are shadowy that are i mean totally it feels like okay so we're beyond the point where we need because you've got people who are putatively involved in the project who are actually don't know what's going on because there yeah. is not transparency and that feels like yeah that's kind of beyond the point where you need governance at some level. and and to the point that you a foundation is better later i think that's really real too <laughs> so <laughs> like i i don't think it's it means that you should have a foundation sooner i think it means that like you know whatever the structure is it just needs to be explicit and not implicit and like i think you can see this in rust right now i think you can see it in nix right now um i think you can see it in a lot of communities in the past where like those implicit power structures and people's ability to just get what they want because they under either understand it or have a posse or they're the loudest on twitter or whatever like there needs to be a mechanism that allows that allows for people to resolve their conflict and ultimately, like, without an explicit way of resolving conflict, then what do we do? You know, like, it's oh going to get resolved one way or the other, you know, <laughs> I have a lot to say about this. And I guess I've, one of the things I want to jump in on with this topic between implicit and explicit is like the way we're talking about it now is like we kind of like a evolutionary progression, which I do agree with, which is like when in the beginning, everything is implicit. And then there's kind of this perception that, like, you know, the goal is to transition it to explicit. Um, I, I would, and this is potentially a bit on the nose, but, like, I would say, and I have said very publicly on Twitter, that I think one of the biggest problems in Rust right now is that the power modes in Rust are all incredibly implicit. Which totally. is kind incredibly of surprising implicit. because we have a lot of documentation and a lot of kind of laughing about about a lot of this like kind of very distributed structured yeah, but like, nobody's willing whatever. to actually commit to leadership they're only willing yeah. to be like eh, there's a council well so i think the next thing that i would say and this is like perhaps some of where things get really dicey and i think is part of like the failure modes of this current situation is that the transition <laughs> between implicit power and explicit power is very difficult and it's very as as someone personally who spent a lot of time advocating for creating more explicit power structures with accountability structures like in the project like mm-hmm. you are not a favored person when no. you are doing that this is and why it's it better to do really, it when there's two of you yeah and it's yeah, really it easy yeah. to turn that person into a villain yeah um I, and i made a i made a random <laughs> comment on Twitter that it, that there's an executive that's needed. And the reason is that you can be a villain. Like not every CEO is beloved <laughs> because sometimes they have to do things that people don't like. And like the, what's good about that is you can fire them, you know, like, yep. like, uh, and also what's good about that is they can do things you don't like, which may be necessary in order to actually write the metaphorical ship. I would also say what's good about that is all that, great. Adam is so great to th- thank you so much for coming by briefly. The, but the um, th- I also think that the presence of that and the presence of that accountability acts as a check on your own actions, which I think is extremely important. That you, 
when you have to put your name to something, you, I mean, this is SOX compliance has been huge, right? CEOs having to put their actual like name to their financial statements and certifying it, it really changed the way people actually process this stuff internally in companies. Because when you have to put your name to something and you have to take accountability for it, responsibility for it, it will change the way that 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 you that you act in a positive way because you begin to think about what are the ramifications of this? How could this be misinterpreted? How could this be interpreted in a different way? And it will it will force a good leadership will will seek out this kind of moderate middle. And you know, I know I, I think Jeremy Sawler's here. Um, Jeremy had a great tweet over the weekend where. Uh, you know, he was saying, like, look, the, the problem that I see it here is the the lack of transparency is a huge problem. We've been calling it implicit. I would say that actually right now, or I'd say up until now, because I think I, I, I'm optimistic that things are going to change with Rust. I think it has been worse than implicit. I think it's been secret. And secrets are bad news. Um, I, I really do not like secrets. Um, I'm... I, I'm, I'm I'm an overshare probably, Adam. You're probably like, hey, you know what? You could use a uh, a little more secrets. By the way, you, you <laughs> well, don't need to. Uh, maybe you could. And, uh... and not, not not to expand on the taxonomy too much, but it's it's not just uh, you know this this secret. It's this implicit secret where uh, I, I think like you know things get signed by you know gr- groups and groups. people don't even know who the the folks are behind this groups. It gives a lot of anonymity. And a lot of, you know, cover to lousy decisions. Um, I think in the name of you know protecting one's privacy and so forth. Well, on the other side, say, like, yeah, please. Oh uh, well, just on the on the two reasons I think why why people do this, and this is not necessarily an excuse, but I think it's at least a physics of the situation. Is one, it's like worth noting, and I know it's been explicitly like considered as part of this situation like when gamergate went down in the tech sphere from like 2015 to like 2019 or whatever like raving hordes of just complete bigots were like absolutely ruining people's lives and like stalking them and like those people are at least aware of the people that were targeted by those things um, and so they do want to make sure that like that doesn't happen. I think that we are in an explicitly different situation today. Um, but like that is something that people are worried about. And like it does ruin people's lives, like for sure. Um, I think the other one, which is like more interesting, is that when we talk about transparency, it's important for us to talk about transparency at scale and what the economics of that are. and also try and recognize the levels of scarcity in which a lot of these governance bodies are operating in. Not an excuse, but being fully transparent takes a lot of work. Like doing it well, not just like, oh, here's like 200 pages of minutes, like have at it. Um, Though, I don't know, maybe AI solves that for us. Uh, But yeah, like, like it's hard. And this is where there's a transition that happens in open source governance that people get real spicy about. And I don't think people have resolved this at all. I have my own personal opinions. But it's the idea that you need to have people working in governance that aren't the meritocratic technical genius authors that you started with. And then how those people can remain powerful and like respected Um, when they're making these tough calls, when people are like, oh, well, you aren't, like, really, like, contributing. Um, It's it's a big problem. It's, like, a big... And that's where, like, I've seen a lot of this stuff fall apart. It's where Node fell apart. I think it's where Rust is at the moment. And in terms of where these contributions to the community, namely contributions to the governance, are not viewed as as technical contribution they're not they're not viewed on, on the same kind of level as technical contributions and it, they are indeed they're they're viewed as kind of regrettable that, that not an important part of the of the community they're often seen as people trying to grab power right yeah i i have to agree almost 100% with ashley here and everything she said in the past 8 minutes that i've been here um there is 
there are a few things that have struck me about the Rust project in general. Um, and I haven't been on the inside like some of you have. Uh, Steve has been inside. Ashley has been inside. Um, and Adam and I are in your category, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. So uh, from the outside looking in, it, it appears to me like there are a lot of people who could lay a claim to having official, you know, vested power from the Rust project. And that is a serious issue. Uh, when you look at the leadership chat that's been built, uh, it includes all of the people on the core team, which makes sense. It's a small team. It includes basically all the people outside of the core team on all the other teams. It, it's a... Uh, it, it, well, I, want I to clarify, estimate it includes several in, dozen people. Um, I believe it's 17. Um, yeah. But just to be clear, the, it's not every member of every team. It's the, um, the co-leaders of each team? Yeah, it's the leads. which And you can have multiple leads on a team regardless of the team size. But, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and there are multiple leaders on several of the teams. Uh, it, it is a, an astounding amount of people to come to any consensus, even if you had a mechanism by which to come to consensus. And uh, there is no such mechanism. And I believe that I believe very strongly that projects need to limit the growth of of who is in positions of power until they have a, a well established mechanism by which to do that, and that people who are placed in positions of power need to be those kinds of people who are willing to put themselves on the line any time a decision is made. And that has not been the case. We, basically, what what has happened. From my perspective, and please correct me if I'm wrong, people who contribute heavily to Rust can then ask to be part of the the um, groups, the core group, the library group, and because of their contributions to the code, may be given a spot on those teams. Not because they're a good leader, not because they're good at managing things, but just because they... They are good contributors, and that is definitely not a way to build uh, a set of publicly facing individuals because good coders are not good managers necessarily. Uh, we're good at managing machines, not necessarily good at managing people. And then what ends up happening is that those kinds of decisions they're made are treating people as though they're machines, you know, telling a person, oh, well, your your talk wasn't exactly what we expected, so we're going to downgrade it from a keynote to just a regular talk. It's something you could easily do to a computer, <laughs> but yeah. not to a yeah. to a to a person. Well, I I want to jump in just briefly because I, I do see some folks bristling in the chat, and I don't think it's like entirely. <laughs> Is there a bristle emoji? I didn't respond. To bristle. Um, <laughs> And I'll, 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 I'll respond to what Jeremy said with this, which uh, <laughs> we'll see is I, I would go so far as to say that like how governance works in Rust is kind of like worse than what you said, um, but potentially not like for the reasons that you think. So mm -hmm. it is true that for many teams and in particular like technical teams, um, which I'm, I'm already like getting myself into a hole there probably, uh, like you are largely like, invited to be part of the contributor group, part of the team, part of leadership based on your contributions. Um, I do think it's reductionist to say that it's strictly based on your technical contributions. There's folks who have like invested like their work like exclusively in documentation or like exclusively in error messages, which like you can is maybe formally code, but like ultimately like a lot more to do with user experience. Um, and there's lots of people who have gained like leadership roles as a result of n not technical communications or, or contributions. And I, I think folks, the, the path is much harder, I think, for that. And like, I think you see less of it, but it definitely exists in Rust. I think the harder thing is like how much power people think those people should have. Um, like, I, and this is spicy, and then I'll, I'll step back. And I would love to have Florian chat about this, too. I know he's in the audience. Um, 
It's worth noting that the current state of governance is the result of what I, as a joke at least, but I don't know how much of a joke it is, called it a coup, <laughs> like two years ago almost at this point. Um, but like this wasn't the state. And this isn't to say that like the state of Rust before then was good. I, I've actually explicitly said many times that it was bad. But one of the reasons it's like uniquely bad right now is because a lot of people decided that there wasn't enough representation from technical contributors in the governance. And for lack of like time, I'm just going to say like kind of tore it all down. And yeah. then they were like, we'll build something new. And then like two years later, it's like, dang, building something new is like really hard. Uh, <laughs> When I, th yeah. I think it does get to, to Jeremy's <laughs> yeah. point, Jeremy, because I think you're making a, a very good point and one that is obviously time tested that uh, technical contributions and human interactions, uh, you can be good at one and not necessarily good at the other. Um, and we often do uh, have a lot of folks who are in positions of leadership because of their technical contributions. And then they are, are, uh, they don't have the ability to really navigate conflict, which ultimately is what we're talking about here is right navigating conflict. We talked about, you know, wh when you, you need governance is when you're navigating conflict. One thing I would just like put in a, a, a just a quick uh, pitch for. Um, the, so Rachel Stevens gave a talk at Monktoberfest this past year on introspection gaps. I don't, I don't know if you, have you seen this? This is a. No, I haven't. Oh, I see Rachel man. in the chat. Hi, Rachel. I, um, this talk is terrific and i've actually I, it's one that really rewards re-listening um about and I, i'm actually i've been sending out a bunch of links to this talk i'm gonna send out a bunch more links to this talk um to folks that are kind of wondering how to proceed especially when you when you screw up or when you're trying to understand how to navigate conflict and you know one of the things that that rachel talks about there that i go back to again and again and again is that so much uh, bad behavior from ourselves, speaking for myself personally, but I see it in others too, bad behavior comes from fear and getting to that fear. What are you afraid of? And asking that question directly. Um, and Rachel, thank you very much for that. Again, terrific talk and really highly, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's a question that I have asked of myself a bunch. I've, I've asked of others too. And I think when we... When, when so when there is conflict, asking people what are you afraid of, you can often get to, uh, I, I and I feel that you can you can get to uh, away from from what is this kind of Machiavellian maneuvering and get to what are we actually trying to do here and what is the outcome that you're trying to prevent or trying to move towards and why, and getting people to kind of talk frankly about that I think is is really really important. So Jeremy, just on that point, I because I, I think that th this is a talk that a technologist it, it can resonate with a technologist. They can understand and begin to kind of put some words to some of these things. Because I think when we when we don't do that, and we you know Adam, you're fond of the the the, 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 the squishy humanness of it all, and we like to we we want to disregard the squishy humanness of it all, and then we end up, especially with these implicit uh, structures, where we end up doing things that are that really have uh, pretty bad consequences and um, intentionally or no. I think one thing I want to add to that, and I guess it's what I was a little concerned about with what Jeremy said, uh, is like, I don't think, like the same way I don't think this is unique to Rust, I don't think it's unique to tech. Totally, yeah. And so like, I, I hear you on like, oh, you, it's easier to imagine someone treating someone like really transactionally when you think about like how they engage with a computer. But I don't know, there's also a whole bunch of like coders <laughs> that do distributed systems and like, mm -hmm. I don't know, computers can be super complicated too. Um, well, so, although, like, I, I, actually, I you are right, but I do feel in other domains, in, other dom in, in any domain, you have this, this challenge that someone who is good at that craft will be ultimately be managing people and they won't necessarily and because i was on the board of a preschool for many years and they had like similar but totally opposite problems and actually i know you were being a teacher you probably saw a bunch of this where they are being a great teacher also does not make you a great manager of people but the the failure modes are totally different 
And the uh, so I, I do think that there's something that is a common theme across all domains. But I think that we I do agree with Jeremy's point that you do have this idea that in our domain, one of the failure modes is, frankly, a lack of of empathy and thinking strictly mechanically. I, I say I don't know of any open source communities where there hasn't been drama. So to to add to the point you just made that there is no perfect governance structure and even trying to imagine it is not going to come up with with it but there are places that I felt much more comfortable i think elixir actually when i was dealing with elixir it was a much i maybe it's a smaller community i don't know what it was but it felt much easier to deal with and uh more disconnected from the sort of things that have happened recently to rust so yeah, go I ahead. Have, Ashley, I have like two responses that I feel like there's kind of like two two things on the table right now. So the first thing I want to do is I get why we say like, oh my god, there's so much drama in Rust, but I also think that it's reductionist and yeah, I agree constructive. That. Yeah. Um, Here's the thing, when you're work and like I have had people tell me this a bunch and it doesn't really comfort me that much, but like when you're working on something that freaking matters, like stuff happens. <laughs> uh and like the more it matters, like the more people care, like the more stuff. Um and so like it's worth noting that like and maybe I'm in this startup world and I've been completely corrupted now, but we're like we're it's, it's at the hockey stick like inflection point as far as growth goes. Like it's literally like in a rocket taking off right now as far as like popularity. So the stuff is just really freaking hard and if nothing was going wrong publicly, I'd be then worried it's going wrong because privately. something <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, the fact that some of this has happened publicly is at least like it is a testament to some amount of transparency. Um, That's true. I still think all of it could have happened extremely differently, but it is what it is in hindsight's 2020. I mean, um, I can imagine if every, if every person had to sign an NDA to, to do anything with the Rust conference, then we never would have heard any of this. Yeah, and NDAs have absolutely been weaponized inside the Rust project before. Um, okay. And it's, it's gross, true. and it really sucks. Yeah, uh, we know all about that in the hardware the world. So. Um, so, like, there, there are worst-case scenarios here. Um, I do think that there's, like, really interesting structures to look to. Um, I'll admit that I've kind of, like, not been exploring the open-source side of things for a while. But, like... I mean, there's a lot of, like, activist cultures that I think are really mm. interesting that have, like, cool governance structures. Um, I think at least one of the things I'm, like, uniquely kind of excited about, and I don't know if you would strictly call it a uh, governance structure, but since conflict resolution and governance is something we've been mushing together in this, I would say I think a lot of, like, restorative justice practices are really interesting. Um, and I think would probably really benefit stuff like open source, because I think... One of the biggest struggles that people have with open source is accountability and how it relates to personal sacrifice. So if you think about how an open source government, like an open source project grows, like it's often a hobby. It's also, it's often the source of like all your friends. Like it's like one of your primary, like, like social side gigs. And like when we hold people accountable, especially the way we were kind of taught to after Gamergate with these codes of conduct where it was just like zero tolerance. Like if you are going to be held accountable, like a lot of us think that the way that you're supposed to hold people accountable is to just completely socially isolate them. And that's terrifying. It sucks for the people who have to do the isolating and it sucks for the people who have to be isolated. It's like really high stakes. And, and that's so why these back channels get built. To, to try and hide uh, things that may be that may cause an explosion. People do things in DMs when they would have used public channels. People people talk one on one with people and cancel talks when when they would have done it uh, publicly. It's and I don't think any different governance structure will change that if the people are the same. If the people are the same, they're still going to talk to each other through DMs. They're still going to make decisions that way. Uh, even even you layer on a governance structure, there's no guarantee that that it's going to actually be followed. Well, the, or, the or thing that I was going to say addresses that, 
which is mm -hmm. I think if we had ways that didn't feel like jumping off a cliff to manage conflict and accountability, yeah. it would be a lot easier to make mistakes and to mm -hmm. do so publicly and to be able to own up to it. Um, and I think that that's something like Brian mentioned, like Russ has learned a lot from previous projects and adopted those things and grown. Like, I think like many things, like I think there's been an overcorrection <laughs> uh, and that like a way that Rust deals with a lot of its problems is to disappear people, <laughs> which is like super messed up. Um, and like, that, again, it doesn't just affect the people who get disappeared. It affects everybody who knows that person got disappeared. It's like, well, I don't want to be disappeared. Like, these are all my friends. Like, what I'm going to, what do I do? Um, and so I do think it really starts with trying to think about, like, how we punish people and how we, how we react when something goes wrong and how we can, how we are able to, like, restore the situation and bring it back together without resulting in like trying to punish people and socially isolate them. I think that's something that if the Rust project could do, it would help it a lot. We could catch problems a lot earlier before they become disasters. And uh, in many ways, we'd be, we'd, we'd be able to try and like, you know, in ways save some people. And by save, I kind of mean like retain them because uh, we'd lose lots of people. And I think that that's really sad. Now, the same problem comes back to it, though, which is that, like, uh, when open source operates in a scarcity mode, like, restorative justice, if anyone here has ever participated in a restorative justice process, is so time-consuming. Like, doing the right thing takes so long. And when you're operating from a place of there's so many things to do and not enough people to do them... I'm so stressed out. What do I do? It becomes really easy to just be like, make these problems go away. Uh, and that's, that's just really tough. And like, I know I'm the, the leftist here who's saying it's capitalism's fault. <laughs> and it's like the most <laughs> cringy thing to say ever. But like when we realize that like this massive influx of money into open source has not been an influx into solving like these types of problems, like I think it's no surprise that like they are the ones that tend to dominate these things like if we paid <laughs> if i gave a talk at microsoft research once about supply chain security like they invited me to talk about like rust and supply chain security and like in a classic way i was like yeah i'll give that talk and i like, didn't talk about supply chain security at least not in like the <laughs> classic sense i was like <laughs> the humans of open source are the supply chain security crisis uh that yeah. we have right now we, we um, are all downloading software off the internet and running it like, yeah we, and i, I like I, that at all so I spent a lot of time talking about that, but like I think it's true, but like there's no startups for that. Um, no one's like throwing a ton of money at that. But like I, I think that that's genuinely what needs to happen. Like someone, I think it was Brian said earlier, like a lot of this stuff, this bad stuff comes from fear. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are really, really afraid of doing something wrong and having the internet attack them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would make the point, and it's that sad perhaps, because that's what's happening. <laughs> perhaps the leadership of Rust should be limited to those people who are okay being publicly attacked. And the rest can always lay behind the leadership's decisions. Like, oh, well, that was, that was a decision of, you know, these five people who are, who are tasked with taking the brunt. And it's just... Yeah, uh, what, here's the thing. When that happens, like, that's kind of what was happening with the original Rust core team. And, like, those people took the accountability. And then, like, no one really yeah. liked them that much anymore. And then so they got rid of them. Yeah, I would know. You, I know. All yeah, the would, people I used to know yeah. are, are out. It's, it's crazy. And JT just left. It's, I don't know anyone there anymore. Personally, at least. When I, th I think that the, really this is the challenge because like leadership, leadership is really challenging. We've kind of, we've been using leadership and power interchangeably, which I think is really unfortunate because mm. I, I think that uh, when you phrase it as leadership, which is what it should be, what it is, uh, it is a much more accurate expression about what you, what you can and can't do. I mean, in terms of the, the actual like, power power is kind of limited and unfortunately it's limited to the kind of actions that we saw that kick us off where it's like yeah you can figure out you know what the program is for a conference like that is actual like decision making power but there is in most projects in most entities it's there, there's much more leadership than there is power it's much more 
getting people to do to go in a direction that you think is the right direction and i i feel that we i, I jeremy i agree with you that we we need that need that leadership and we need that leadership to be accountable and it's not fun it's hard and i think actually to your point of like yeah it's to the point where like it, it's such a downer to have people doing this that they get thrown out because you know the, the the project needs to want that leadership, and I think that that's that, that's part of it. So actually, actually, let me ask you a question. The you know one of the things that's kind of interesting about Rust is that, and I think it's part of its success as well, is the fact that Graydon is not really involved, and the fact that there is no, uh, th th there's no kind of authority, single authority to appeal to. Is that a bug or a feature? I mean, I guess it gets into the back into the BDFL question a little bit, but I mean, it, it, it depends it does on what of... your expectations are. What do the docs say? No, I'm um, sorry. That's a Semver joke. Uh... <laughs> a little uh, Semver humor. Also... What was that? A little Semver humor. Yeah, the tough crowd. Um, I also <laughs> see that Rachel has her hand up, and so oh yeah, get her, cool yeah, 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 Rachel. Something. But I guess the thing that I would just quickly say is. I think like many things, like it really depends on your perspective. Like in the grand scheme of things, I don't think that an individual person, like I don't think it would be tolerated. Um, and so I think that you have to do something different. Uh, weirdly, the economics of it being a single person are much easier. Like this is why no one talked about like the open source, mm -hmm. like maintain like sustainability like with linus and linux like because like he just makes like millions of dollars and he doesn't have to worry about there being like 40 other teammates who also need to make a million dollars um but yeah i mean sometimes i mean there's there were times when i was in the core team and like i'm sure someone will quote this to because they're mad at me or something but like man like if only just one person had to make the decision it would have been a lot freaking easier like it would have been so much nicer and like we could have gotten something done faster and like when speed matters like it can be helpful and like in those situations you're like well why didn't delegation happen and i'm like well who how do we decide who to delegate like it becomes an infinitely recursive situation um so it can be hard to move quickly when you have to move quickly and you are seeking consensus but i ultimately think it is is the better strategy I believe Graydon would have said no to some things that we all like now. Yeah, and I think that's, that's all, totally fair. Yeah, well, this is what I mean. That uh, I'm not even sure that it's the and it, it, actually your point. Like that's not something we've got, so we've got to figure out a different model. Hmm. Um, Rachel, welcome. I, this, I thanks again for that talk. By the way, that talk is just so good. I was just re-listening to it again recently. Well, thank you. But there, there are so many things that I have to talk about here. <laughs> it's been a fascinating discussion. I think for me, what stands out from a lot of Ashley's comments in particular is how hard it is to deal with nuanced situations. So I, I think like when you're in a place where like there's very clear harassment, there's a very clear violation of a code of conduct, like we can codify what we do. We can have procedures. We can have a way that we deal with it where it's challenging and where we all seem to run into walls over and over and over again is when it's it's a gray area is it's somebody is behaving in a way that's not helpful to the community but it hasn't actually broken any code of conduct somebody is going in a direction that doesn't necessarily help the community at large and it's those conversations those conversations where we have to have tact we have to have nuance and we have to think about the humanity of the people on the other side that's where i think we all tend to get stuck because we can't necessarily have a, a necessarily a forethought plan on terms of like this is what we do in this situation it's more of a we have to react in this situation how are we going to do that how does this all make sense and I, I think that's where things get tricky does that sound right to what you have yeah. experienced actually yeah. oh my gosh yeah, yeah. Yes. and i think the only potential like correction and i suspect that you actually would probably agree with this is that more often than not, it's the gray area. Like the times when the black and white oh, yeah. happens is yes. like so rare actually that you're kind of like, I guess it was a good thought exercise for us to come up with those procedures because now we are practiced to do it on the fly for all these gray ones. But yeah, of all the situations that I dealt with in Rust, 
around that kind of yeah it it was always like gray like the the most gray gray <laughs> Yes. The black and, and white situations are so great when they come up to a certain degree. It's like, okay, this is terrible, but like we can all agree it's terrible. So it's really easy to actually know what to do here. Um, and honestly, yeah, I get a steady sense now when I think of situations like that because I'm like, you're probably not right. <laughs> like you're probably missing something. Oh, interesting. yeah, yeah. It's yeah, all yeah. ambiguity. Yeah. It's always easy when it's just Nazis. Like, yeah. Oh, you're a Nazi. Okay, blocked, banned, easy, move on. But the, the, the common case, Rachel, is that ambiguity, that yeah. the, the nuance. Yeah, it's so hard. And I think it comes from a couple of different angles, too. Like, one, it's we have to come up with all these processes on the fly now, and there's all the physics of that type of situation. But, like, especially, and this is where the situation with Rust was just getting exponentially more difficult. And, like, at least during my quote-unquote era on the core team, we spent almost all our time on, like, crisis communications and what you might call like marketing and pr and that's because communicating subtlety to a large diverse group of people is almost harder than just dealing with it like and when it comes like there's the dealing with the subtlety and then there's the having to communicate it and those are they're both just like incredibly incredibly difficult mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we tell our clients over and over again that the market has an amazing ability to not understand nuance or subtlety in any mm -hmm. sense. But it's especially true when it is um, a, a people situation. Um, one of the things that I think was really interesting that Ashley was talking about then was the, the, going back to that feeling of fear and feeling of reaction. Because I, I think that it's this balance that we're trying to strike in terms of we want to be transparent. We want to communicate. We want to go quickly. We want to build communities where people feel welcome. And sometimes not all of those things can happen at the same time. Like, how do, we, how do we deal with these gray areas where we don't know exactly what we want to do? We don't know what the right course of action is. How do we be fair? How do we be transparent? How do we not take this all to a back channel? But also, how do we not, like push these people out of the community in the process of trying to figure that out. And like, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I think one of the things that like, I don't know if you, how you do this, but like the, in some, the assumption of intent in this process, like how do you make it so that you can help your community understand what it is that you are hoping to accomplish by these conversations in a way that feels fair to everybody and have people assume the best of what's going on. And I don't know if you can build that retroactively. But it's something that I think is lacking. I think I just, I, you are so spot on. So this is like, I guess, ancient history at this point. But back, back, I would say back in Rust Mozilla days, um, there was a conversation that started in the Rust community around this talk that was given by Aaron Turan and Nico Matsakis, who were the like managers of the Rust team at Mozilla, I think at the time. And it was their prominent leaders in the project. And the, the talk was called, like, Why Wasn't I Consulted? And it talked about mm. the some community dynamics that Rust was starting to deal with in its RFC process in particular. Um, and the thing that they talk about, they talk about many things in the talk. I'm, I'm sure I also, like, forget half of them. But one of the things that stuck with me that I brought to, like, my corporate career and stuff was that if you want to have, like, a pluralist, like consensus seeking community the number one most important thing you have to do is communicate a clear vision um and i don't know that's what comes to mind when i hear what you're saying rachel like there needs to be like we need to know like where you think we're going like where where are we going with all of this so that i when i gave a keynote with those two with, there was this thing where the aaron quoted i think esr about like all software is like a programmer scratching their own itch and that the goal of like communicating vision was so that everybody can itch in the same way. Oh, I think Nico said that. Anyways, it was like a really gross kind of visceral metaphor, but like really what we were trying to say. Um, and in like the last days of the core team, as I was on it and experienced, like one of the things we talked about a lot was shit, like we need to be communicating vision more. Like we need to be doing that like leadership like work and what was interesting is that like i think a lot of what ended up exploding that was that there were a lot of people who felt very possessive about what that vision should be 
And I would probably count myself as one of those people. And that there, what we discovered was that we no longer had it. And like, I, to what Rachel's point was, was like, it's really hard to do that retroactively. Like we didn't keep up communicating the vision. And so people's vision started fracturing. Yeah. And then when we went about to say like, oh no, this is what we need to be doing. Like the problems that we're having in the system we created are because we're missing this one piece. Like we, there wasn't like a clear agreement on like who owns that vision and what vision should be shared. And like, I think a lot of folks on teams were like, why should the core team own that mission, like vision? Um, and yeah, that's where a lot of things broke down. Yeah, interesting. And it, it is really hard to identify what the vision is right now. And uh, like you said, it's it spread across a whole bunch of people on different teams, not just the core team, but each team, each individual on each team has their own vision. And, you know, the, the thing for me is I probably could live with Rust as it is right now forever. I, I don't know of any other features I would need just building on on top of how it is right now. And it's really hard when RFCs come in because if you're not thinking about a specific feature and you're you're on one of these teams, how are you going to, you know, get up the courage to spend your time reviewing every RFC that affects things you might look at and then later down the road one of these things lands and you don't you didn't know about it and you don't like it, then you go back and Probably the same. The same thing has happened thousands of times. Um, and and, Wait, and I, Jeremy, why weren't you consulted? Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. why wasn't I consulted? <laughs> right, and exactly. Same problem. Well, it's and just, it, it, there's so many people who who want different things, and I think you know that's a very good thing for Rust. Uh, but it ends up creating a lot of conflicts and ones that are dealt with after things land, uh, as opposed to you know at the proper time. It goes to a point actually that you made last time about how the that the, there is this kind of power of time and that people who have the time to read the RFC are kind of implicitly granted uh, a little more power than the, than those that that don't and that that, yeah. that can be a, a problem. Florian, you you joined. I know you've got a lot of perspective here. Would love to get you in here for your thoughts. Yeah, I've got the perspective from other time zones. Um, time is actually an interesting topic because I think this has been. A thing that we've been seeing here and that I've seen on the core team before in much lower stakes, where, for example, things happen with people see something, want to give feedback on it, see it at 11 o'clock at night, want to go to sleep, and the morning it's already posted. Um, for that reason, I had actually enacted a rule, or I pushed the core team in the end, enacted it for no communication happens. Um, 48 hours, like unless it's really, really urgent, 48 hours um, after a decision has been made um, or after something has been proposed to make sure that people around the globe have time to give their feedback. So it's two times the, the globe turning is um, really interesting and the they, they get a really good approach. And one thing that I find interesting about open source governance, we're often talking about uneducated leaders leading global projects. And that's a tough call. Um, and it's, I think it's important that given the size that the projects now have, as Ashley has referred to, we slowly start talking about management standards or leadership standards, um, for also for the sake of all the other projects that need to figure that out the hard way. Um, yeah. And, and what, and what guidance do we provide those folks? Because yeah, now you are in a, you know, uh, what does the role, I mean, with this, uh, someone had asked this question on Twitter, it's like, what does the role of a manager look like in an open source project? And, you know, uh, how do we actually, uh, how can we kind of encourage the right kind of behavior? And Rachel, I don't know, you mean, do you have any, any concrete suggestions on how we, you know, if we all agree that the ambiguity is the problem, are you going to give us something that is non-ambiguous to help us solve all these ambiguous problems? Are you going to how do we deal with the nuance? Give us something cut and dry to deal with the nuance. Someone, someone said boars should be the BDFL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh, alas, I, I don't know if I have anything that is um, 
Damn it. Un- unambiguous here. <laughs> I, I do think um, one of the things that I, I like that time is the issue here. Like, I wonder if there is coming a tools and ways with, with kind of this, God, I hate to be the one who brings up AI on this, but like, is there a way where we can start to um, communicate? So instead of actually saying drop, dropping 200 pages of minutes, like, can we make it so that we can have better summaries? Can we start to surface kind of higher level points more recently? Like, can we make it so that we have tools that help everyone feel more consulted? Like, maybe that's part of the problem, but that's definitely not going to solve all of the human feelings, but maybe there are tools on the horizon that can help us better inform people about what's going on. That's a hope. Um, I, I don't know if that's actually in the cards, but that would be cool if it was. I would definitely share just because we were talking about the RFC process. Like I super agree with Rachel and I'll admit like, <laughs> I forget where I saw it. So I'm sure I saw this probably on like Reddit or something, but like a lot of people were disappointed in core and like, didn't think that they were valuable. Like during the era when I was on it, because a lot of what we did on core was a lot of this paperwork <laughs> that you're talking about. Um, it was so important, but like, it was a lot of work that like needed to get done and it needed to get done with somebody who like had all the context. Um, but it wasn't like uniquely like interesting or special work. Um, and I, I think there's a ton of, a ton of this work that probably, I don't know if it's AI or like some other assistive mechanism, but like for RFC, like the core team and the Lang team, I think in particular spent a lot of time with this idea of RFC shepherds, which is like the human version of potentially what you're talking about, Rachel, where like there would be people assigned to the RFC who would like do roll-ups and summaries like throughout the conversation to try and like do this. But here's the problem. And I, I think this goes back to my economics point not to be super repetitive it's just like no one really liked that and no one really like respected the people who did it and so just it was a job no one wanted i think i think one of the things is uh, i think pieces are there and we don't need to invent too much uh this week in rust the newsletter is actually a, a good model on how you can regularly communicate things every week um and some people that want to drill down to the notes they do it Others, they don't. Um, so the question is, what do you put in? Um, the other thing, coming back to the problem of, of leadership education, I get leadership ed- education to my position in my company. And I would love if that were available to, for example, a foundation to, uh, to team members of open source projects, because a lot of that needs to be tuned. So one of the problems <laughs> is that obviously if you get if if you're getting a business education, you're getting education for I lead people that are on my payroll that I can fire and mandate things to, which as hard as it sounds. Um, but in the end uh, it comes down to this. Um, but um, that's the assumption that your coaches are coming from. But on the other hand, you learn uh, a lot of concepts that immediately made a lot of things click. For example, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a training at First Systems where um, the coach introduced us to illusion of agreement, which is the mm. group thinks they're in agreement, but they're actually not. And that made a lot of things over the last five years click. Uh, <laughs> um, and making these things accessible and also educating people that it's actually worthwhile and that it takes the stress of their work to get educated in that instead of having to figure it out um, one by one and reinventing it, which is a very open source thing to do, um, I think makes sense. Totally. And I, I think that the, the a false consensus has been, I, I, I mean, it's been a problem. I think it's, it's a problem in, in it, when you are so conflict avoidant you run the risk of of now overly incentivizing a false consensus because we are trying to avoid conflict. And so people feel like, well, I don't actually agree, but I, I just, I'm going to say I agree because I know we, can, we don't have the ability to have the discussion about this disagreement. Um, or I'm going to like, actually, I'm just going to take a hike and uh, the, because this is just not worth it. Um, and I, I, I think that the, 
you know, getting the the language to be able to attack some of this stuff directly, which is why I can, I'm, Rachel, I'm going to once again uh, the point people that your talk about uh, Laura is asking in the chat, has anyone given a conflict, a talk about conflict avoidance in open source? And I would love to watch it if they have. Um, I do feel, Rachel, that your talk gets to some of this and gives people a common language where they can begin to think about like, what, where is this discord coming from? And I think you were talking about some kind of, I think, focusing on, on more obviously bad behavior to a certain degree. Um, I don't know if you've given thought about, uh, well, actually, to, to Laura's question, has anyone given a talk about conflict avoidance in open source? I don't know of one if there is, but I would also love to watch it. So I, I, I will go on the hunt and see what I can find. Um, I, th I think one of the things is, is it's when I, when I was kind of talking about it, it's like the two sided thing. And for me, the, there, there's challenges both in my ability to introspect and also my ability to communicate in a way that is not conflict avoidant, but also not hurtful. And that's a really fine line to walk. And it's mm -hmm. even harder if the yeah. opposite, the opposing party <laughs> is not willing to do that introspection piece. So I do think it is one of those ones where ideally, like we, we as a community could all work on this together. I want to try something out on this group. I, I think some of the mechanisms of communication make this kind of bandwagon effect happen even faster. Uh, someone was mentioning this earlier, but I think that there's this sort of tyranny of the idol where if something happens in chat and the people who are busy kind of don't have time to weigh in or maybe they'll get to it later. And the folks who are there in chat and responding and awake uh, and not in some you know far-flung time zone from the person who originally posted can build ahead of steam very quickly. And then, you know, not far from being, um, you know, it, there's a, you almost have to exert the effort to get in the way of it. And it's very easy to just let a proposal go of its own built momentum. Yeah, um, this, is, this is a very good point because especially when you're coming into the Rust project to do something as a third party, usually you have a, a reason for it, a business case. You know, I need this feature, I need this RFC, and I need it now. <laughs> and so you'll push the changes through as fast as you can uh, and and the people inside of whatever project you're working on, uh, if they don't have time to deal with it, this happens to me all the time with Redox because we have a lot of European contributors, and they get annoyed at me. They're like, "Why aren't you merging my PRs when you know an hour after I send them?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm the BDFL and I'm asleep, so so they don't get merged." Um, but if there was, you know, five people who all had the ability to merge, they'd merge them while I'm asleep. I'd wake up and maybe if I'm lucky, I would go back through the log and see what was merged. Uh, if I'm unlucky, I would notice, you know, days or weeks later when something stopped working and I go back and do a git blame and, oh, well, looks like somebody merged something while I was asleep. And that compounds the more people you have on a project who can do this uh who who have you know commit rights or the right to speak for a project or or whatever rights and and they do it outside of the knowledge of others then you build up a almost exponentially based on the number of people uh this kind of bad feeling of being sidestepped yeah Jer the last point i make on this is that i think people have the the feeling that of participation that is to say hey jeremy you were in the chat brian you were in the chat yeah. right because and, <laughs> and your silence must have been assent rather than right. you being on vacation or being right. asleep or being doing some important work so you get yeah. the as opposed to everyone sitting in a room or even on a conference call I thought uh, we it's hard to, to just tune out exactly well i think it's also important just I think this is maybe what Brian was referring to that I said in the, the last conversation that we had. But like the way you have power in open source is that you have time. Um, and regardless of any like governance structure you could possibly have, like yeah. if you have time, you are going to be able to get so much more done. And well, so and as, and actually, there's a great point in the chat pointing out that this is not unique to open source. This is actually true for all volunteer organizations and oh, yeah, totally. parent teacher associations and HOA oh. boards. And if like, oh, if it, I think all humans will be triggered by one of those two. Either <laughs> so here's, here's the other thing that I would say 
it, though, is like open source is kind of at a weird point. And I would also call out that Rust is at a weird point with this. So when the core team was exploded two years ago, it is worth noting that over the three years before that, it had transitioned from basically 100% full-time paid employees of Mozilla to basically 100%, well, maybe 98, I don't know, almost all volunteers who were not paid full-time in any capacity to contribute to Rust in any way. While at the same time, all of the teams, particularly the teams that, and I'm sure I'll get in trouble for this, the teams that people think are more important, um, those teams were getting pokemon by Fang. Uh, <laughs> and this Bravo. had a really massive effect on the legitimacy and efficacy of governance in Rust. And it's really easy to say, oh, do I have an echo? Well, it's really easy to say that like, oh, corporations are coming and messing up Rust. I don't think it's like directly that, but it is worth noting that a lot of governance shifted without anybody really noticing or meaning anything malicious about it. When a lot of people had like a lot of positions lost a lot of money and therefore time and then a lot of other positions gained an immense amount of money and an immense right. amount of time it's the same people but they're they're the things that are funding them and that's what's important in a capitalist market you can't eat you can't do anything uh if you're not being funded so and and of course people like brian and i are are well funded and right, have no say, time. Like the, the, yeah, fidgeting uncomfortably no in my seat here, talking about capitalism and rust, <clears throat> working for oxide. The I, I, I would say though that I think part of the reason, from our perspective, that and I this is where I do wonder how much to kind of lay at capitalism's feet, um, because fortunately there is no company around rust or mm -hmm. company around cargo, and I feel speaking in like in the node community that when you had companies around node companies around npm then i think things got really ugly really 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 quickly and it just happened that, with docker too right they well those docker weren't explicit pulled out all of the yeah Wait, i i okay so one of the things that i did that made a lot of people really really upset with me is i advocated for what is probably one of the most basic rules in open source governance which is that you should not allow, especially because we're a consensus seeking organization, you should not allow more than, uh, I, I forget what number I picked, but there should be a limit to the number of people from one single company that can be on mm -hmm. a single team. That rule doesn't exist in Rust. There's nothing like that in Rust. And I would just encourage you to look at the team membership. Yeah, like and I guess- explicit yeah. teams around like parts of Rust or Cargo or Crates.io, but there's, definitely implicit ones mm -hmm. yeah and you do get i, I mean I, I and i've got kind of mixed a mixed kind of reaction to that because on the one hand um i feel that it it assumes that everyone is kind of speaking for their corporate vessel all the time and it becomes complicated because when somebody changes companies it's like does that mean that they get kicked off or what have you but on the other hand, I do feel that like when you've got everybody on a on a team that is actually also in this other structure, namely this corporate structure that they all have in common, it is a little bit uh, talk about implicit power structures. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does feel like the, the extreme there is something we definitely want to avoid. Uh, and so, it, it, Ashley, how was it? How was that that received? Because I, I do feel like, and part of what I. I I, I guess part of, of my reaction to that is like I, I would rather have the principle than the rule. Um, but I don't know, maybe the rule is necessary well, because we can't agree on when what the I principle was, is. When I was selecting board members for the Redox OS nonprofit corporation, it's I intentionally did not invite anyone who worked for System 76 and the, the company I work at. And the reason being that we have a very strong conflict of interest policy and having any voting block be from the same company would have seriously violated that. And uh, the project is not a nonprofit corporation. It doesn't have tax exempt status by itself. That would be the foundation. So the project itself has no legal requirement to do this, but I still think it would be a good requirement. Yes, I yeah. 
the thing I would share is to be clear, like when we set up the Rust Foundation, like board membership absolutely has these rules. And right. I think, Brian, I mean, boards have solved this for years. Like if you lose your job or like you change. Yeah, sure. no, it's true. Yep. There's a lot of ways to handle that type of stuff. Yep. I, I also will say like based on the chat, um, it sounds like people have accepted this. I don't know if it's strictly for the leadership council or if it's for team membership additionally, um, but it sounds like there's going to be some amount of this rules in the Rust Projects governance, which sounds good. Um, when, when I shared it, uh, I mean, I think people felt really threatened by it. They felt like, and I think it was because it was like an actual problem and like a lot of this hiring had already happened. Um, but like people are like, I don't know, like, can't we just trust each other? And I think this is another interesting portion that I think contributed to rust, like, I'm going to say stumbling on this transition, like not making the handoff well, is like when projects start like early on, like a lot of it is like, oh, well, these are like all my trusted friends and I, we don't need like policies and rules because like I just trust them. Mm -hmm. and, like if I set up rules, I would be like insulting to them because like these are just my buds and like I don't think they'd ever screw anything up. And oh, there was a lot of resistance in Rust when I, there was like, I had, I had encouraged us to do this thing called the charter program, where it was like, every team should write down like what the team's goal is, who the members are, how they get members and like how you leave. Um, and like, they should have a process of like evaluating themselves and like whether or not they're doing a good job or not. Like if they're meeting their goals. And that was considered really aggressive. That was considered like, mm -hmm. Like that was, and it was because like, I, I don't think it was, I think it was like a, people weren't being evil or anything when they were rejecting that. They were just saying like, everybody's a volunteer and working hard and doing their best. Like, why would we want to institute something like that? Like it would be breaking that trust. Yeah, it's just a hobby project. Why do we need to add all this paperwork? But Rust is not a hobby project. It's, it's the foundation of a, seriously large ecosystem of software and we've seen what's happened when people don't know where it's going or what it's doing there's somebody doing something wrong but we don't know who and we don't know why and and the amount of public freak out from this is is just incredible and i can guarantee you there was quite a lot of internal discussion about this too that wasn't public in the companies and organizations that that use rust like, is this still a language we can trust? These are, these are people who have done something, and worse than doing something, have not explained why it was done or, or who did what or, or anything. For a long time, that's, that's how it was, for, for days. And so basically, you know, at System76, at Redox, everything I'm, in, I'm involved in, it's, you know, what do we have to do? And if Rust is no longer a marketable element, you know, do we have to pivot away from things do, just to because there's public backlash? It's it's quite a lot of damage well, so the, that uh, can be done. It, yeah. It's so actually, the kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, they, it, it's a multifaceted problem um, for us who have always been a small company in the space. It has been a huge problem that there was no clearly communicated expectation of what it means. Um, to be, for example, how to take over a team leadership. I can't account for that, and I need to account very sharply. I don't have a billion-dollar runway, so uh, I have a, a one that is counted in twenty thousand dollars or more. Um, and um, for me, it also became a huge issue at that point when I was actually in the core team representing the project at the foundations board, while also being managing director of one of the members that people would chat me up in company calls on my positions on the core team and on the foundation, which is also one of the reasons I retreated, because the moment we would run even into the perception of a conflict of interest that would be extremely damaging um, to our profile, and um, that just became, became too complex. So um, these rules are not only internally, but also externally. And to add another point, um, if you can communicate, hey, we would like to participate in leadership of this team, and the project uh, says, well, that needs at least 10 hours of work a week. That's actually something I can take to my boss. 
rather than, hey, are you okay if I'm team lead here? Yeah, sure, you can do that on the side. And later you discuss what on the side means, and they probably meant two hours and not 10 or something like that. So having yeah. firm agreements around that is interesting for smaller players because then they can um, account um, for, for that. Sorry, Brian. So we uh, we got to run. Um, I, unfortunately, we got uh, this is a challenge during this time. So we got a hard stop here at at ten. And of course, we're in the new uh, era of remote work. Um, and if you're you know two minutes late for a meeting, people assume that you're dead. So um, we I, we are do need to run. This has been a great discussion, Ashley. Thank you so much. Um, and Jeremy and Rachel and and Florian, great job from Adam as well. Um, I, I think that you know uh, th this is tough. That this is tough stuff. I think the point was made earlier that. Uh, part of the reason that this has been tough for Rust is because a lot of people really care about Rust. And uh, I would also say that that one of the things that that, I, that this has been a, a difficult issue for us kind of to to process from a leadership perspective, um, I do think that there, broadly this is a community that uh, that sees eye to eye on a lot. So um, I think that it, it would be hasty to uh, to walk away from a lot of terrific elements of this community. Uh, and indeed, I think we'd be falling into the trap of overly avoiding conflict as opposed to actually like looking at me eyeballs. And uh, if you take one thing away, I would really encourage you to watch uh, Rachel's talk on the introspection gap. Uh, and I will uh, merits a rewatch uh, if you've already watched it. So um, thank you again, everyone. Ashley, thank you especially. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, now I'm going to need to go communicate that I've not been lost at sea to my to my next meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.